Welcome to all and greetings in the name of Jesus to each of you. It's good to see so many people out this morning. This is a very special service. It seems as, as we get a little older, communion means just a little more each time. We serve a great God. He has blessed us with so much. A beautiful day, whether the sun is shining or not. Uh, God is, is, a, is a great God, and this morning we have gathered for communion to be reminded of what Christ did for us at the cross. It's beyond our comprehension. We can't be thankful enough. In Sunday school this morning, we were reminded of praise and thanksgiving, and truly we have much to be thankful for. It was a good lesson. It was a good beginning to our service today. And I look at the scripture that Pastor Brent has chosen, and we're going to be blessed. As I read through that scripture, when I got to verse 11, there was something that really stood out to me. It said that they were supposed to eat it with haste. The Lord's Passover. They were supposed to be ready. There was instructions given, and they had to be kept. And it says they were to eat it in haste. And what really stood out to me was because it said, it is the Lord's Passover. This wasn't Moses' Passover, and nor was it Aaron's. It was the Lord's Passover. Moses and Aaron were chosen to lead it. And they had to have, there was, <clears throat> they had to make their preparations before they were even fit to lead it. And that makes me feel very unworthy this morning. I kind of wish it was somebody else up here. Yet it is a privilege and a blessing. I will say this. You're all invited to communion this morning. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're ready and you're prepared, I think I mentioned last Sunday, if we're ready for communion, we're ready to die. This morning, you're not coming to Maple View's table. You are coming to the Lord's table. And as Pastor Brent and the elders, we're here to, to serve you in the best way we can and Forgive us where we fall short and where we could do better. For a call to worship, the Lord laid on my heart to read uh, John 15, verses 12 to 17. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. And then he closes off in verse 17 and says, these things I command you, that you love one another. This is a commandment. This isn't just when it suits or when it fits or when we think it's right or for those who think we think deserve it. This is a commandment that we love one another. And that really that really stood out to me. It's how it talks about greater love has no man than, he, than, than the, if you would lay down your life for them. And we know that that probably isn't going to happen. And yet, it, there could be instances where that maybe could happen. But we'll let that aside. Uh, I had to wonder, what can we do uh, to make a sacrifice to others that costs us something or that we do willingly. And, and I just had to 
There was just a few things that came to my mind. And when I think of sacrificial ways, we can show love. And we can show love by listening to others, by simply helping others, by encouraging others, and sometimes by giving in various ways. Those are sacrificial ways in which I believe we can represent what the Lord Jesus Christ is, is teaching us. At least that's what, uh, what God laid on my heart and on my mind. Uh, and when we, as, as we think of, of helping others, you know, when I think of you dear people here at Mapleview, you're very helpful. You've been a blessing to us. You're a blessing to each other. A couple of years ago, a person from this church gave us two Bibles. And they said, when you're <clears throat> at the market, if somebody needs a Bible, give them one. We had one Bible left that was, I used to wonder if it would ever get a home. A couple of weeks ago, there we received, I guess I'll call it a new customer at the market. Her and her husband, they're probably in their 40s, I'm not sure. They moved here from London. They don't have a family. I guess it's fair to say he's probably an atheist, or he certainly doesn't acknowledge God very much. In fact, June and I haven't even met him, but it's just what Lisa told us. Uh, she's extremely intelligent, and I'm not the judge. Uh, she's asking a lot of questions. I'm not sure where she's at in her walk with the Lord, other than she knows very little, and she didn't have a Bible. We didn't ask her. I just had a feeling this woman doesn't have a Bible. She was looking at, sometimes I say we look at all the, for all the answers at all the wrong places. But when you did say something, and June was very good with her, if Lisa would ask a question, Chun could answer it. And they struck up a real friendship. A couple of weeks ago, I said to Chun, I think that lady should have that Bible, and she agreed. I took it home, and I marked John chapter 3. I wrote a note in it for a few other verses. And the next Saturday, we had a... They were talking, and when it was time for her to go, these aren't long conversations because there isn't a lot of time, but they can take five minutes or more. And June had put the Bible into a little brown bag and handed it to her and said, here, we have something for you. And the reason I say this is the glow on that woman's face and her expression of thankfulness for a Bible, I can't explain to you. It was simply said with a smile on her face and a great big thank you quite a number of times. And we even, June even received some texts during the week thanking us for the Bible yesterday as she was there and she said thank you again. I will never forget the, the, her face. She held it like this, she pulled it up, you could see about this much of the top of that Bible, and the, the pages on the top were covered, were covered with gold. And it looked really nice. It's not a brand new Bible, but it's really in good shape. It looked like brand new. And when she saw that Bible, she said, a Bible, and she hugged it like this. You could not have taken it. That's how much she loved that Bible. Do, we, do I love my Bible that much? And then I had, we had a real eye-opener on Monday. We were, June and I went for a little drive and we came past the farm gate, and there was a a sign on the post, a board that said, "Daniel prayed." Did you? Just another challenge for all of us. I'm so thankful that we can gather today and commemorate what Jesus did for us at Calvary. 
And I know already that when Pastor Brent is done sharing from Exodus chapter 12, that we'll all be blessed. We prayed for you, Brent, and pray for each one of you. Each one of you are very special. Where we have let you down or haven't been where we should have been, we ask for forgiveness. I believe to all of us, I would want to leave a word of encouragement to each of us. I would say, life is short and eternity is forever. Give all the love that you can and then try and give a little more. I want to pray for a man this morning because he requested it. He comes to the market. His name is John. This morning is not prayer and sharing. He lives alone. We would call him a jack of all trades. If you'd ask him to help you, he'd be there. He's very kind, he's very honest, and he's very sincere in his walk with the Lord. He walks with the people downtown. He lives in that area. And I, I, I can't imagine what sometimes some of those people down there think when, when John speaks to them. John was there yesterday, he left, and about a half an hour later he came back. And when he was there the first time, we didn't talk church. We talked about the Lord and his goodness. We did not talk church at all. He came back and he stood in front of me and he said, when you go to church tomorrow, will you pray for me? He had no idea whether I was going to church or not. He said, when you go to church tomorrow, will you pray for me? Would you pray for me? And I said, yes, John will pray for you. I knew, even knew at that point we weren't planning to have sharing and prayer. But I said, yes, we'll pray for you, John. I said, what's on your mind? I had no idea what he wanted to pray about. And he said, I'm not vaccinated. And he said, I'm scared. And I said, why are you scared? Because, he said, life is getting better for the vaccinated. Or did he say, it seems it's getting better? And he said, for those that aren't vaccinated, I'm really scared what's coming. Because instead of it getting better in the last two years, each time there's a move, it's a little tighter. And I don't like what I see coming. And I was wondering if you would pray for me. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Kind Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you have given us and for this opportunity to gather. You are a great God and you are greatly to be praised. We thank you for the people of this world. We thank you, Father, for the people of downtown Kitchener. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us. And Lord, forgive us where we fall short. This morning I bring John to you, a dear man with an honest heart. I pray, the Father, that you would remove his fear. I pray that you would give him confidence. I pray that you would give him courage. I pray that you would help him where he, he, where he needs it the most, whatever his need is this morning. Father, we don't want to ask amiss if it would please you. Would you let John know at this moment or at some time that we're thinking of him? And we pray, Father, if it would please you, would you meet him and give him special grace and strength and hope. I pray that you would be with him as he mingles among the people, that he would be a shining light for you. I thank you for my dear brother John, and I pray that you would give him perfect peace. We thank you, Father, this morning for this special service that we have gathered here. We thank you for the opportunity Thank you for my dear brothers and sisters and all the Christian friends that are here this morning. I pray that you would be with each one in a very special way. Minister, Father, by your Holy Spirit to each individual according to their needs. The requests that are made that are silent, O oh, Father, would you meet them as it pleases you. 
I pray that you would undercourage each one for those who who feel discouraged, for those who uh, feel lonely, maybe they feel left out, wonder if there's any hope. I pray, Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, that you would meet each one where the need is. Lord, thank you that we can leave it with you. As we move forward in our service this morning, I pray that you would uh, be with Scott as he leads out in the, the children's feature. I pray that you would be with uh, Jeremy as he leads out in song and, and Pauline. I pray that you would be with each one of us as we participate. I pray, Father, that you would stand with Pastor Brent and that you would anoint him from on high. I pray that you would allow him to speak the words that would minister to us, that would give us words of encouragement and hope. And where warning is needed, I pray, Father, that you would put that into place according to your perfect will for your honor and for your glory. I pray that you would be with Glenn as he leads out in the foot washing. Father, would you just undertake for each person today, from the very youngest to the very oldest, time is short and eternity is forever. I pray that you would uh, meet us here at Maple View. I pray that you would give us a keen desire to be a blessing and an encouragement to each other. I pray, Father, that you would make us to help wherever we can and we're and speak words of life and encouragement and if warning is needed that they can be spoken I just pray Father that you would have mercy on all of us thank you Lord Jesus that you died on the cross once and for all for the whole world you died and you gave us a commandment to love each other so Father I pray that you would help us where we're at today we ask all these favors and blessings Father in the precious name of Jesus, and I'm going to invite you to say the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite Jeremy and Pauline to come and lead us with our song. Uh, welcome everyone here to our service today. Um, Got a few empty chairs at the front here yet, so please make your way into the front because it's it's way better at the front. And you got a mask on so you can hide behind your mask, right? So anyway, grab your songbooks and please stand as we sing number 296. We have come into his house, 296.
turn over a couple pages to 301 and just observe the, the, we're going to be singing a medley here, which includes like 302 to 306, I believe. So we'll sing 302 and just kind of work our way through without any breaks through the songs. So number 302. One forty seven, I stand amazed. One hundred forty seven. Took my sins and my sorrow 
may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good, it's good to uh, be here with all of you this morning. And uh, this is a children's feature time, um, but we're all children, so uh, feel free to join in. I see there are some children out there, and I'm just gonna glad you stay where you are this morning, and we'll uh, we'll uh, have our, our children feature. Um, there is a picture. On, yes, that's the picture. So some of you may have seen a picture similar to this probably many times and didn't even realize it. Maybe you did. There's a picture outside um, by the water cooler that's very similar to this. I think it's it's done by the same same artist. Um, so when I see this picture. I th- there's a lot of things I think about. Um, so what, what do you see in this picture? What are some things, what goes through your mind when you see this picture? So it, the children can, can share or, or the bigger children can share as well. I'd like to have it kind of interactive. So, so when you look at this, what, what do you see? Don't be shy. Butterflies, yes. That is very prominent in the picture, yeah. What else? What what goes through your mind when you see this this picture? <laughs> Worm. Yes, yes. So we have the worms and we have the butterflies. Um, change. Yes, definitely change. So I think um, Ben on Monday at our Thanksgiving service, Ben then kind of touched on the the whole caterpillar changes into the butterfly that type of thing. Um, that is definitely something very evident in this picture. Um, when I look at this picture, I see, first I see just a beautiful picture. The artist did a beautiful job. I think his name is Goyce, and I know some of you have met him proudly and know him. I don't think I have met him, but um, it's a very beautiful picture. So that's kind of the first thing I see, just the, the great art, artwork that he did in this picture. And then I also I think about the worms and the butterflies, um, just that, that amazing miracle that happens. You get a caterpillar. I don't know if you ever did this. Maybe some of you children have done it, or when, when some of you were younger. I know I used to like to catch caterpillars, and there was a great spot on our farm where there was a lot of caterpillars. Um, so I'd catch them, and I remember at least one time um, I had some caterpillars that did the whole chrysalis thing, and, and uh, then out came the butterfly a little later. So just that miracle. Um, that's another thing I think about when I see this picture. Um, but I also think about um, the miracle that happens in our own lives. Um, I see, the, I see the tree in the middle of the picture, and uh, it kind of reminds me of the story that Jesus told of, you know, when he said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Um, I see that tree representing Jesus, and uh, he encourages us, encourages us to stay connected to him. And I see the, the caterpillars crawling up that tree, so, in, you know, it could be representing us crawling up that tree, connecting to Jesus. And as we do that, Jesus transforms our own lives. He makes us from, from this caterpillar. Some caterpillars are nice looking, some not so much. Um, but he transforms each of our lives when we stick connected to Jesus um, into something beautiful. Um, and that beauty, each butterfly looks different and each of our lives looks different. Um, 
but it's Jesus that does the transforming. And then I think, too, of, of how um, growing up, you know, children especially, even adults, um, when we do good things, we get rewarded. Um, so in school, if you, if you work hard and do good on, a, on an assignment or a test, you get rewarded. Um, and adults, we work hard, you know, we may um, get a bonus at work, and we may, you know, that's kind of the way our world works. And yet Jesus, with Jesus, it's different. Um, with Jesus, we don't, it's not because of our, the good things that we do that, that he uh, invites us to connect to him and, and transforms our lives. It's not, it's not because of the good things that we do. It's just because Jesus loves us. It's not, you know, today is a special day because we are uh, celebrating communion together. We're remembering and celebrating what Jesus did in our lives um, on the cross, how he, how he did that for us. And it's not because of the good things we did. We can, we can, uh, we all, none of us are perfect. We all do not so good things. Um, so we can still, Jesus invites us to come to him even in the midst of our messes and our, and our uh, sin. And he says, come, come, I love you. It's not, it's not because you're a good person that I love you. I love you because God says I love you because you're my child. And God says he is pleased with us. He, it, it, he is pleased to call us his children. And Jesus says he's pleased to call us brothers and sisters. Um, and it's not because of the good things we do. Um, and I know in my mind I sometimes get that mixed up. I think if I do the good things, then Jesus will love me more. If I, if I spend a lot of time reading my Bible, which are good things to do, um, if I help out at church, good things to do, then Jesus will love me more. But in fact, Jesus loves me um, before I do those things, and it's out of his love that I can do those things. Um, so I'm going to, um, after we're done here, I'm going to hand out um, just a bag of chips and uh, some fruit gummies to the children, um, just to kind of help help us all to remember um, why we're here this morning. It kind of represents the, the grape juice and the bread. Um, and I haven't been watching the children this morning if they're behaving or not. I don't know what your mornings were like. I could, I could ask your parents, and, and they could maybe tell me some stories, because I know how Sunday mornings go sometimes. But I'm not watching, and I'm going to give each child can receive this. It not, not, doesn't matter if they were having a good day or a bad day, whether they were behaving or not behaving. Each child can receive this gift. And this is a representative of gift of Jesus. And in the same way as adults, um, Jesus wants to give us this gift. Um, yeah, so let's pray together and then I'll, then I'll hand it. And I apologize in advance to the parents. The rappers are not quiet, but don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> let's, let's pray. Yeah. Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. Um, thank you that for this, this gift that you have given each one of us so we can connect with you. Thank you for how you transform our lives. And I pray that you'd be at work in each of the children's lives as they learn um, to follow you, learn what it is to love you and how you, how you love them. Um, I pray that they would, um, they would connect with you. I pray that you would transform their lives just like you transformed that caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly and how you're at work in each of our lives, um, transforming us each day. It isn't a quick process, and it's, it seems to be a never-ending process, um, our lives here on earth. But I thank you that you are doing that. And all we have to do is say, yes, Jesus, that's what we want. Um, I pray for the children that, they would, that you would touch their lives this morning, um, that they would realize that you, are, you have given them this gift as well, not just the adults. Um, thank you for this time. I pray you bless the rest of our time together. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Scott, for what you shared. It was for the big children, for the little children and the big children. And yes, Goyce is a, a great artist. We had the privilege of being in his house, and I seen a little bit how he does it, and he had a number of pictures going, and he's amazing, simply amazing. For a scripture reading this morning, Brent has asked to, that I read uh, Exodus chapter 12, verses, I believe it's 1 to 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month 
shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto the house take it, according to the number of souls, every man according to his eating, and shall make Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his high head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And this shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the, the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be unto you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout all your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. May God's blessing rest on his own inspired word. Invite Brent to come and share the message. Passover, remembering our salvation. God be with you as you come, Brent. Thank you, Nelson. If you knew that you were to die tomorrow, and this would be your last full day on earth. How would you spend your time? You'd, you'd try to make every moment count, wouldn't you? But, but how? What, what would you do? Who would you see? What, what conversations would you want to have? What messages would you want to make sure that you deliver? Jesus told Peter and John, go, make preparations for us to eat the Passover. He knew what was coming. He knew there would be a nighttime arrest. Mocking insults, a thorny crown, a mob demanding his execution, piercing nails, the rough cross hoisted up at Golgotha. A criminal's death. Yet on the eve of that unfathomable sacrifice, Jesus reclines at a table with his closest disciples and he says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. His people had celebrated Passover for well over a thousand years. Why is this so important to Jesus? Why is he so keen to share it with his friends before he dies? They're on the brink of a new exodus. Like Israel, so long ago. 
the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. So they were still in the land of slavery. Pharaoh refuses to free them. They're powerless to save themselves. And yet there in the darkness of Egypt, even while they're still slaves, the Lord speaks. And, he, and as he does, he creates a new reality. Pharaoh has commandeered their time for so long. What, what have those days been like? Just an endless repetition of wearisome toil. <laughs> One commentator points out the drudgery of slavery day after day after day after day. Would it ever end? But by the word of the Lord, a new era breaks in. Here and now, even before the final plague, from this moment forward, the calendar of Israel will begin with the month of their salvation. The Lord says, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. So there's nothing they can do to win their freedom. But they can only watch in awe as the Lord shows his power over Egypt, turning the Nile into blood, then plaguing the land with frogs and gnats, flies, disease on livestock, festering boils, hail, locusts, and oppressive darkness. Israel is spared. They can only marvel as the Lord acts to save them. But now, Finally, he gives them something to do. They, they can't add a thing to their salvation. They can't in any way make it come quicker. <laughs> they can't earn it. But, but the Lord gives them a feast. From generation to generation, they are to eat it and remember. This is their part. By faith, even before they're free, they are to celebrate and to remember. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share it with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. So all Israel is to eat, with no one left out. No one should gorge themselves, and no one should go hungry. The Passover lamb, it's not to be eaten alone in a corner, but as families, as households, sharing with neighbors. The salvation to come is for every Israelite. Each is to have a place at the table. The Lord says the animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. At this age, they're, they're almost full-grown. Males, sad to say, are not as necessary as females. Farmers know this. <laughs> they, they don't give milk. Fewer are needed for breeding. So it makes sense that the Lord would ask for male sheep or goats. Still, it's not the time to cull out poor specimens. Israel is to choose flawless lambs and kids, not diseased or, or malformed. It says, take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Now why, do you think, why should they be chosen and kept for four days before Passover? Why, why not just choose them earlier that day? Well, there might be different reasons for this, but one reason is it does give time to make sure that the animals really are healthy and that there really is enough for every family. This is a holy task. The people are to prepare carefully. 
It's not to be haphazard or just something that's slapped together. They're to choose carefully. They're to prepare well. Then they're to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. Why? Why this display of lamb's blood? It must have struck them as odd. There's no record of the Lord ever asking his people to do something like this before. But we'll see. This becomes an act of faith. As they do this in obedience to the Lord, this signifies that those who are inside the, these houses, it signifies that they are trusting the Lord to save them. Now, he, he explains more later. He says, That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without Yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the, the head, legs, and internal organs. So roasting meat this way is, is simple, and, and it, it's tasty. Right? I think most people like, like barbecued food, barbecued meat. But you, you don't need a pot to make it. You don't need many utensils. Bitter herbs, they're easy to find and harvest. And they would remind later generations, too, that the slavery of Israel was bitter. Making bread without yeast was, was also quick compared to waiting for leavened bread to rise and, and then bake. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left until morning, you must burn it. Well, why? Why can they not save leftovers for breakfast? Wouldn't it make sense? Well, this is a special meal. It's a salvation feast. It's to be eaten together. And as they do that, it binds Israel together in faith. You know, to eat the elements of the Passover in some other setting, that undercuts its purpose. It devalues it. it it's like treating it like a cheap snack. So earlier, I just want to clarify. So earlier, I, I had, had mentioned that the male lamb or goat, it's not as valuable as the female. I just mean for the, the future of the herd, right? I mean for the, the future breeding program. That was not a comment on the significance of the meal. But just, I see the Lord's grace in that, right? That the, their herds can continue even with these sacrifices. Just, you know, sometimes you say something, you realize, well, that could actually be taken wrong, right? That wasn't the point I was making, so... Anyway, the Lord clarifies, too. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So their rescue is at hand. The Lord wants them ready for a speedy exit. Do they believe it? Will they eat in faith? This, this readiness is a sign of their faith that the Lord really is doing something new and they need to be ready to go. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. It will be the final blow, a tragic Necessity. Because Egypt has sinned against the Lord. Pharaoh, who represents the whole nation, he has had every chance to repent. But he stubbornly refuses to free Israel. The tenth plague will reveal the Lord's judgment on Pharaoh, on this nation, and on their so-called gods. For so long, Israel has been enslaved by this false belief system. 
The Egyptians use it to justify how they treated Israel. And we learn that Israel, as they live under this system, that it's begun to infect them in all kinds of different ways. So, so with his mighty power, the Lord is going to expose these lies, these lies that keep people in bondage. The Lord is sovereign. He is strong to save his people. This oppression that seems immovable from a human point of view, when people are suffering, it can often feel like, well, this will never end. We're, we're, we're stuck in this forever, but it's not true because the Lord is far above every power and principality. Everything that can enslave us. We have to notice too, though, that Israel is also under a death sentence. They have been oppressed, but they're not innocent. Like the Egyptians, they have also sinned against the Lord. No one is righteous, the Bible says, with just one exception. That's Jesus Christ. The men and women of Israel, they had sinned in all the usual ways that people sin, whether through gossip or greed, adultery, dishonesty, violence, contempt for a neighbor. The book of Joshua tells us, too, that, that in their captivity, they had learned to love the gods of Egypt. And so they also deserved the judgment of God. But in his mercy, the Lord offers a way of escape. He says, the blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are, and where, where, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. There will be death in every home that night. But, but every Israelite family can choose who will die. Will it be their own firstborn, or will it be a substitute? A lamb. They'll signal their choice by marking the door frame with blood or by leaving it bare. Now, does the Lord need help to distinguish between Hebrew homes and Egyptian homes? No. Do, do, do they need to persuade him to forgive? Or do they need to prove they're worthy? No. No. But he has appointed this sign. By smearing the blood around their doors, they are giving a simple testimony of faith. A life has been laid down in the place of their firstborn, just as the Lord commanded. And so they are signaling, they're declaring that they are taking, we are taking our place among the redeemed. Just imagine the conversation as Israelite families are doing this as they're slaughtering the lambs, as they're painting their doorways. Just imagine firstborn sons. They must have been especially grateful to see that blood. What a gift. Now, they have a special stake in this, but there, there's more because they also represent their people. Israel is my firstborn son, the Lord confided to Moses on his journey back to Egypt. Israel is my firstborn son. Graciously, in time, he will adopt sons and daughters from many nations, but Israel leads the way as the firstborn. He says, this is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance, a memorial, a day to commemorate. 
remember. The Old Testament uses that verb more than 200 times, remember. So here Moses uses a related word translated as to commemorate or a memorial. In, in biblical Hebrew, to remember, it is to hold something in your mind, but, but it's more than that. It's, it's present. It's active. An Orthodox Jewish rabbi, Gaiden Rothstein, calls Passover a spiritual time machine. He says, on Passover, Jews are told to see ourselves as having left Egypt. We're not just required to remember that our ancestors left Egypt. We are supposed to see ourselves as having left Egypt. At, he says at the beginning of the Seder, the, the Passover meal, we're supposed to feel like slaves. And by the time dinner is served, we're supposed to feel like free men and women. We say we were slaves in Egypt, not our ancestors were slaves in Egypt. And we could give, give examples from the Bible as well, where, where people of Israel you know, are, are to, to speak in that same, same way. Well, now, what's, what's the difference here? Is this just kind of splitting hairs a little bit? About how do you define like, what it means to remember? What, what, what's the difference? Well, he says, one is telling a story that happened to someone else. The other is living an event that is happening to us personally. Passover, he says, is not just a time of remembering. It's a time of re-experiencing. So you can see that biblically. So that generation that was in, it, that was in Israel, the Lord brought out, clearly, clearly they... He experienced something amazing and wonderful, this, this freedom. But, th but that gift of deliverance was not for that generation alone. It was for every generation to come. And, and, and that, that event, how the Lord had intervened to save his people, that was to impact and transform the, every generation to come. By his grace, the Lord enables his people not simply to retell, but to relive the story of redemption. So, so before they leave Egypt, he gives instructions for those years ahead. He says, for, for seven, let's see, I need to find my, my place here. For seven days, so I'm in verse 15. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. So now this introduces another element, does it? And we wonder, well, what, what's this about? What, why, why is the Lord asking them to bake without yeast? Well, to start with, it's a practical necessity. There's no time for yeast baking on Passover night. In later years, it will remind them how they had to hurry out of Egypt. But there's more. The flatbread also speaks of a new beginning. Normally, when they made bread, they'd set aside some dough. I mean, they wouldn't buy just grains of yeast at a store. <laughs> they'd, they'd set aside dough already full of yeast spores, and they would leave it to ferment. That became their leaven. That became their starter for the next batch. How many of you bake sourdough? I think, I think it's the same kind of um, idea, isn't it? Yeah. So, so then when they would add flour, the yeast would, would spread, and so the new loaves would rise. Leaven very literally brings the past into the future. Right? So then each, with each new loaf, there'd be, be part of it, some leaven that would be taken. And, and so there's, there's this like generation after generation of yeast gets passed on through the bread. So when the Lord tells Israel to bake bread without yeast, it is signaling a new beginning under the Lord's leadership. In verse 16, 
He says, on the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That's all you may do. So these are days for rest and for worship. To Pharaoh, the Hebrews had no value except for laborers, except as laborers. Why would he ever give them a day off? He wanted to squeeze out every bit of work that he could out of these people. What a contrast with the Lord, with the Lord's heart for his people, the Lord who sets them free, who redeems them as sons and as daughters, who, who brackets their first week, the first week of their new year, with these celebration days. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The Lord will save them mightily. But we're prone. They were prone to forget, and so are we. We're prone to forgetting our salvation, aren't we? The story in... Um, Claire Davis, he described the Christian life as a combination of amnesia and deja vu. <laughs> of forgetting and then again remembering what we knew all along. Again and again, we need to remember and relive what God has done for us. I know I've forgotten this before, <laughs> David says. Can you identify with them? What have you forgotten before in your life with Jesus? Well, while they're still in Egypt, the Lord lays a plan. He lays out this plan to help his people remember. So picking it up in verse 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once. So, He's received the instructions. Now he's passing it on to the elders of Israel. Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, this, this, um, um, this plant that absorbs liquid really well. Um, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. That's why it's called Passover. He will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Then beginning again at verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night. And there was a loud wailing in Egypt. For there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up! Leave my people, you and the Israelites! Go worship the, God, the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and herds as you've said and go and bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country for otherwise they said we will all die. So the people took the, their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people and they gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians. So this would help equip them in the, in, in the desert. The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Many other people also 
Many other people went up with them and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. So notice this. In this massive exit, notice these are not just the biological descendants of Abraham and Sarah. This is an ethnically diverse group. Do Egyptians join them? What about slaves from other regions? The Hebrews were not the only slaves <laughs> that the Egyptians kept. Were some from Cush, the ancient Ethiopia. We, we know Moses will later marry a Cushite woman. So there's a lot we don't know. What, like what proportion <laughs> were from other nations? But the Lord makes it clear later in this chapter that people from any background can celebrate the Passover if they circumcise the males in their household. In other words, they can join Israel if they accept the sign of their covenant with the Lord, Israel's covenant with the Lord. Verses 40 to 42. Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt because the Lord kept vigil to on that night to bring them out of Egypt. On this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for the generations to come. Oh, there's so much we could unpack in those verses, isn't there? <laughs> but... As the Lord asks them, the Lord asks them to keep vigil as he kept vigil for them. So that is what Jesus does in Jerusalem, in that upstairs room, centuries later. As faithful Jews, Jesus and his disciples, they've kept Passover every spring since they can remember. And yet there is something different. None of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, as they describe this meal, none of them mention a lamb. Have you ever noticed that? Why is that? There's bread and there's wine. But the lamb, the centerpiece of the whole celebration, is either missing or, or, or in hindsight, as they write about it, they... They just give it no attention. Why is that? Where is the Passover lamb? He is there. Not on the table, but reclining with them as their host. Christ Jesus himself is our Passover lamb. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, he says. In the original Exodus, the firstborn sons of Israel are saved by the blood of a sacrificial substitute. The lambs die in their place. Jesus is the beloved firstborn, the only uncreated son of God, he is not spared. He's both the firstborn and the lamb. Not spared. But in the fullness of time, he gives his life as a ransom for many. We don't need any other lambs or goats. Christ Jesus, who is without blemish or sin, he has taken our place. We deserve to die, not just physically, but spiritually. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But Jesus lays down his life as our Passover substitute. He sheds his blood for you, and for me. In 
that blood, you know, we don't. <laughs> Even his disciples at that time, they didn't paint it on the doorposts of, of their, their houses. But spiritually, as we receive him in faith, his blood is painted over our lives, over our hearts. For those who receive him, the Lord says, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Hebrews 10, 18 explains where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. On the cross, Jesus Christ made that once and for all sacrifice. Have you accepted this gift? His shed blood. He will shelter and cleanse you if you receive him. The death of those lambs in Egypt gave refuge to those who applied their blood in faith. Jesus offers a gift far, far greater. Not, not just a temporary protection from physical death, but a share in his resurrection. Because unlike those ancient sacrifices, Jesus has been raised again. He's alive. See the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's, it, this is not simply a mental exercise of trying to remember all that we can about Jesus or as many facts as we can, although, you know... <laughs> probably will <laughs> remember remember Jesus either from certain certain moments in the Bible or times in which we met him but through the Holy Spirit the supper of the Lord the supper of the Lord Jesus it becomes a living event as as Passover was intended to be so so in first Corinthians Chapter 10, verse 16, Paul asks, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread we break a participation in the body of Christ? So Jesus calls us not simply to uh, a mental exercise, although our minds are included, but he calls us spiritually to participate in his body and blood, to spiritually participate in his work on the cross. I mean, I mean not that we do any work, but that we, that we joined with him, receive all the benefits of what he did for us on the cross. And as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father Easter morning, that we can be raised with him. That's what it means to be in Christ that what has happened to him in his experience by his grace becomes our experience. So will you take part? Will you take part by faith in the body and blood of Jesus Christ? And this is something that we, we, <laughs> we, we do in faith as we're gathered together and we share the Lord's Supper, but, but it goes beyond that this participation in the body and blood of Christ. Our whole lives are to be enveloped in Him. Tomorrow morning, wherever we find ourselves, we're to participate in the body and blood of Jesus because we're His. Will you take part? There's an ancient Christian prayer called Rejoice Now. It dates from the 5th century. This is traditionally sung the night before Easter in many of the, kind of the ancient churches. Rejoicing in the Lord, it declares, it is truly right and good always and everywhere with our whole heart and mind and voice 
to praise you, the invisible, almighty, and eternal God, and your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is the true Paschal Lamb who at the feast of the Passover paid for us the debt of Adam's sin and by his blood delivered your people. This is the night when you brought our fathers, the children of Israel, out of bondage in Egypt and led them through the Red Sea on dry land. This is the night when all who believe in Christ are delivered from the gloom of sin and are restored to grace and holiness in life. This is the night when Christ broke the bonds of death and hell and rose victorious over the grave. Praise God. Praise God. This is also our story. This is also our song. I invite Jeremy to lead us in another song and, and let's just, as, as, we, as we do, just reflect and give thanks on the incredible grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please turn to number 364. Come share the Lord. Kind of a faster paced song to sing. So I'd like to uh, just read the words in this song before we sing it. 364. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here, everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here, he breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. Though unseen, he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. See you. 